A blessed Father's Day, and uh, this is what we're going to do. Today we're going to pray for all fathers, so could we have every single dad to stand up, please? Tampanese, Woodlands, and those of you that are online, and uh, well, instead of me praying for you, we actually have our children praying for us. Uh, so first one we're going to invite is one of our spotlighters. Can we give her a hand? Come on. <laughs> She's going to pray for all of us fathers. We are here to worship you and to celebrate Father's Day. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to this world to save us. You are the greatest Father. Now, I leave all the fathers attending this service up to you with adoration and love. Fathers play an integral role in the lives of their children as mentors, providers, caregivers, and so much more. I pray that you will bless all the fathers as they care for their families. Give them strength and wisdom. Support them in their work and protect them all the time. Malachi 4 6 says, He will turn the parents' hearts to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Now, can I invite all the children to stand up, hold your father's hand, and say this after me? As children, As children, we will obey God's word. Respect our Father, love them, listen to them, and appreciate what they have done for us. We will also obey God by... And enjoy learning God's word and want to know him more. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's children say, Amen. Thanks for praying. Before you sit down, we have one more prayer. Uh, can we invite our speak later to come? All right, come on, let's give him a hand. Come on. Awesome, awesome. Okay, take it away, bro. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up all the fathers gathered here in your name. We ask for your blessing upon them and your guidance as they lead the family as the head of the household, to be a leader and to protector of the family, and to show Christ's love through the actions towards the spouse and his children. Your word says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Grant every father priesthood and anointing to function as the head of the household. Grant them your divine wisdom from above to shepherd their children Give them discernment, patience, kindness, and self-control as they deal with the challenges of raising their dis children in this imperfect world. Help them to be an example of godliness, perseverance, and faith to their sons and daughters. We pray for fathers who struggle, especially those who face difficulties in their relationships with their children. Bind the spirit of division, misunderstanding, miscommunication, and release the spirit of unity restoration, and forgiveness. Show them how to love the children the way you love. Let the love of Jesus overflow in them. Fill them with your compassion and strength to rebuild their relationships with their children. Remind all fathers not to condemn themselves, but to continue to learn from our perfect, loving, heavenly Father. Lord, you bless all the fathers and keep them. May your face shine upon them and be gracious to them and grant them the true peace of the Lord. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Pray, brother. Praise God. Grab a seat, all of you. Um, just before I let my children go down, you know, actually, uh, at the end of the worship, I asked my children whether they are willing to come up and say a happy Father's Day. And uh, somehow, well, they are here already. <laughs> actually, they were a bit shy. So, okay, on the count of three, let's say happy Father's Day, okay, guys? One, two, three. Happy, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks. Can you grab a seat? Praise God. I'm uh, wearing a lot of rings today, and there's a reason for that. Uh, these are not real rings, okay? Uh, they're real rings, but they're not uh, expensive. Uh, so yesterday, I was actually doing a speaking engagement in a church, and then my wife texted me to say that, hey, you know, the children are waiting for you uh, before they go to sleep, so what time are you going to come back? So I said, yeah, I'm coming back soon. 
So I finished my engagement, had a quick meal with uh, the host, and then kind of rushed back home. And then my daughter was meeting me at the front door. And she said, Papa, Papa, <laughs> uh, we have something for you, you know. And then when I went to the room, they presented me with two rings each. So I have two rings here. Just for today, we're going we're gonna to wear it. So in case you say, Pastor, it's diamond rings. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, these are not expensive in price, but it's expensive in heart. You know what I mean? Uh, I won't exchange this for gold or silver, really, because uh, these are from my children. So I'm very grateful uh, for Father's Day. And I get to celebrate with them. Later on, we're going to eat chicken rice for lunch. That's what I want to eat. So, uh, no, no, really. I'm going to eat chicken rice for lunch. Uh, you know, my family and I, we've been about two weeks out in Melbourne. So as you know, it's a lot of Western food. Chinese, but not so much. So I'm so glad to eat chicken rice later on. Well, I tell you what, let's pray and get to the word, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. And as this is Father's Day, we want to also wish you a happy Father's Day. You are the great Heavenly Father. Without you, life ceases to make sense. Lord, we are so grateful. You have been so good in more ways than we can even count or even dare imagine. So we bless you. Happy Father's Day, Heavenly Father. And even right now, Father, as we open your word, may we be poured in into what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, and all of us say, Amen. Now, this month we are on the healing series, and we're not going to speak on uh, physical health today. We're going to speak on emotional and spiritual health. And I want to talk to you about the spirit of restoration. And there's a reason why I'm going to do this. Um, in the last few years, as I speak to older fathers, uh, I'm talking about some of my uncles uh, in their uh, 60s, and they all tell me the same thing. Um, this, this, this uncle was a very nice guy. And so we were talking, right? He was actually uh, at one stage helping me to look at properties. He's a property agent, property manager. And so I was talking to him. I said, you know, uh, he was talking about family. And then he looked regretful. And I said, uncle, what, what's going on? And he said he regrets that, you know, he didn't spend enough time uh, with his children. That he was so busy at work, so busy carving out a career, uh, that the relationship with the children isn't as strong as it should be. So he said he's doing a lot he can now, but the informative years, he didn't have enough time. So when the kids come to a stage when they don't need him, uh, suddenly he's no longer you know, a person that can connect. So he missed out those years. And you know, when I heard this advice uh, a few years ago, it did help me a lot. You know, I, I also shared this with my wife. Um, and we make it a point to spend as much time as we can with the children, no matter how busy we are, because we know that, hey, you know, at a certain point, uh, they're going to leave not only the nest, they don't need you like they once did. In their informative years, they need you. In their growing up years, they can fend for themselves. For some of us, we might say, but pastor, my kid is ready in the 20s, in the 30s, setting up their own family, and there's estrangement, there's uh, uh, a spirit of uh, strife, there's no longer that closeness um, that we once had. Today's sermon is to kind of talk about that. How do we have a spirit of restoration? And we're going to look at what Apostle Paul has to say because he's a spiritual father, and he's actually going to speak these words to the church of Corinth. Okay, so let's look on screen right now. And he starts by asking the church. Now, this is not applicable to us in regards to fathering, but just hear what he has to say. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Paul says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not know, realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Now, this is not so applicable to us with our children, especially I'm talking to fathers right now. But what Paul is trying to say to the Corinth church is that before you talk about restoration, is your heart right with God? That's really the question. Uh, because it's hard to restore rightly when you don't have a, a right standing with God. I think all of us understand this, right? Like the minute that we really came to faith in Jesus Christ, something changed. We were genuinely more loving, more caring, forgiving, uh, more willing to humble ourselves. Uh, before we became a genuine Christian, we can see a lot of pride, right? A lot of things inside of us that 
We don't want it to be gone. We, we, we just let it manifest. Uh, and it's, we, it's the flesh, the Bible was said, but to us in that days, so the old days, we would say, you know, it's just who we are. Not realizing that God doesn't want us to stay who we were, but He wants us to become who He wants us to be. Right? So who we were was a sinner. Who we are in Christ is a saint growing in grace. We still sin, but we sin less. And we desire to live holy and righteous lives. And Paul is saying to the church of Corinth, make sure that you're really in Christ. Because otherwise, all your efforts in work and ministry and life is going gonna, is gonna to fall short. So he says to them, test yourself to see if you're truly in the faith. Don't just say you believe, but not really believe. Don't just say you're a Christian, but not really be a Christian. And so it's even a good thing for us to consider where we are. Are we truly following the Lord Jesus Christ? And this is no condemnation. It's a legitimate spiritual test that the great apostle Paul asked us to consider. And then he says in verse 6, let's go on. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. Now he's telling to the church that the leadership, especially the elders, especially the apostles and, and the key leaders of the churches, uh, he's saying, my hope is None of the leaders are failing the test, right? Goes on, verse 7. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may have seemed to have failed. Now, this is an important verse. And this is where I think many of us as fathers and sons and daughters, we can relate. Because you would say, Pastor, you know, before I was a father, I also had a, I had a dad. Right? And I love my dad, I honor my dad, I respect my dad, and I see the flaws and the failings of my dad. And, and this verse kind of shows that Paul is acknowledging that you might see some of my failures, Paul is saying, as a spiritual father. <laughs> you might see some of the failures of Timothy, Pastor Timothy. Uh, no, not, not, not Timothy here, I'm talking about Timothy in the New Testament, okay? So not Pastor Tim Tan or Pastor Tim O, but the Timothy in the New Testament. Uh, you might see the failures of Peter, and Peter, we know he had failures, right? Peter the Apostle. So he says, look, we may have seemed to fail at times, but that's not the desire of our heart. And I'll say this to all of us as sons and daughters, that you might have felt that at, at one stage in your life, your dad failed you. And I'm not here to say he did not. I'm not here to say that. But I can assure you that very likely your dad did not want to fail you. But because he's not God, and because he's a man of flesh and blood, he will fail you at times. So sons and daughters, we have to forgive our parents when they fail us. Because they will fail us. At the same time, isn't it amazing, sons and daughters, when you are now, some of you, a father, you begin to say, oh gosh, <laughs> the very things I accuse my parents, my children are accusing me now. <laughs> the very things I complain about my parents, my children are complaining about me now. So we kind of get into a whole food cycle. But of course, when we are young, we don't see it now. When we get older, we see it, we acknowledge it. It's quite bizarre, actually, you know. Um, I, never, I never expected that being a father, being a parent was way more difficult, honestly. Like, you know, uh, me and my wife, 10 years ago, then we sort of started to have the process of having children. And honestly, you know, like, it's like anything, right? No one prepares you fully. You can read stuff and magazines and books, but nothing really prepares you for parenthood. And then when you become a parent, you're saying, wow, this little life will die will die, literally will die, if you do not feed and care and, and love and nurture this little bundle. It, it, it's, it's so daunting. It, it, it's, it's so humbling in, in a sense. And you're all struck by the, the wide scope of um, responsibilities. And many of you parents understand that you've been through the process, but I want to say very quickly for those of us that are sons and daughters that you are not yet married with children, 
I, I ask you to really show a little bit of patience to your parents. Is that okay? <laughs> show a little bit of patience to your dad and mom because you really don't understand uh, what it's like until you become one. Trust me, on that day you become a parent, you'll come to me and say, Pastor, now I get what you're saying. Uh, but now you don't and, and it's okay. It's okay you don't know what I'm saying because it's not your experiences yet. If you asked me long ago, I would have assumed being a father is way easier than it really is. Now that I'm a father, I can't even say I'm a good father. I, I can only say I'm striving to be one. But you know, when I was naive, I thought I would definitely be a good father. You know what I'm saying? No problem, I'll be a good father. <laughs> but now that I'm a father, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I don't know. I hope I can be, I want to be, I'm striving to be. So my children will see my failures and I need them to forgive me. And sons and daughters, we need to forgive our dads and our moms. And Paul is saying, we might fail. Let's go on, okay? Verse eight, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. I realize now I look on screen that the, the rings are so shiny. So in case any of you just tune in online, uh, these are not real rings. Please don't tell people, Pastor has Cartier. I don't have Cartier, okay? The, these are real rings, but not with precious gems, but with the precious hearts of my children. Okay, so those of you that just watched online, uh, these are from my children. Okay, just side note, side note, <laughs> side note, you know. Coming back, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Now, verse 8 is so powerful because ultimately, even with failings, we still go back to the center core of it all. There's certain truths that holds our family together. Have you considered that? Oops, I just dropped the ring, sorry. Sorry, Rainbow. <laughs> uh, okay, no, it's back, it's back. Okay. When I looked in the mirror at first, I thought I was Thanos, you know. <laughs> you know the, anyway, where am I? Okay, verse 8. We cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. I think we all know that foundationally, truth is what brings families back together. And you say, Pastor, is love. I agree, it's love. Sometimes you forget about the love and you need to hold to certain truths to bring back the love. So at times, if truth is missing, your love will bring back the truth. At times when love is missing, the truth will bring back the love. I'll give you a case in point, right? You might be so upset with your family and then you decide, it's time, I'm going to leave the home like the prodigal son, no longer, or it could be the other way around. It may not always be the prodigal son. It could be the prodigal father. I'm done with the household, I'm leaving my wife and children, I'm done, I'm out, I'm going to be not going to pay any attention to my responsibilities, I'm done, right? And you forget about the love. And then you encounter, for instance, God's truth like this. And the truth, when this sells in your heart and your emotions cool down and your anger fades, and you remember, the truth sets you free, you remember God sent His Son. You remember what the Heavenly Father has done for you, right? And then instead of doing what your flesh says to do, guys, we all know this. Our flesh says, stop, quit, don't care about any other thing. The flesh is very selfish, right? Our flesh is extremely self-centered. We all know that. The flesh. But the Spirit of God that lives inside of us and the truth of God's Word can center us back. God, forgive me that I was not loving. Your truth is now bringing me back to love my family. So that's why, guys, we know that when there's quarrels in the household, once things settle down, there's a need for restoration. You say, Pastor, if normal arguments, is there a need for restoration? Absolutely not, right? Because it's very small. How do you know when you need restoration, Pastor? when the argument is not something that can be resolved, when it continues to fester for weeks and months and years, when your son or daughter holds an offence against you, whether you're right or wrong, I leave that aside, when your son or daughter holds an offence against you for so long and they're still hurt by it, again, whether you're right or wrong, I'm not here to comment, I'm just saying the reality is then you know that restoration is needed. Because it's, it's no longer like coming together for family meals and there is a genuine exchange of truth and, and laughter and, and, and conversation. It becomes functionary, traditional. We got to do it because 
This is what families do. But that's not what we call by truth leading to love. That's what we call by this is what the world does. So we do it. And I think all of us want to see restoration in our homes. You know, the most tear-filled messages and emails I receive has always to do with the families. Nothing bigger than that. You have some people crying out, say, Pastor, uh, uh, I need to pray for a job. Can you pray for me for a job? And they write a whole litany of what's happening. It's, it's, it's hard to read sometimes. But it's never the same as emails that uh, not only me, I'm sure, but many pastors in the world would receive about families breaking down, about a hurt that is not resolved, about a lack of restoration. And, you know, as God's people, we actually have the key to restoration. And so it's time to take it out, use the key and begin to apply restoration to the relationship. And I'm going to speak to the fathers first. Fathers, this is something I know that you might not be used to doing, but it's really okay, fathers, to say sorry when you're wrong. I know you might come from a background that you'll say, Pastor, Men don't say sorry. You know? That is not Jesus. That is ancestor traditions that have been passed down through the generations. It's okay for fathers to say sorry. In fact, can I tell you that, fathers, your sorry can bring so much healing. Pastor, you mean everything I say sorry? Don't mishear me. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the things you know you should have done better. So for instance, the uncle that said, you know, I wish I spent more time with my children. If the next time I meet him again, I will say, you know, brother, why don't you tell that to your children? Just say, you know, I wish. I'm sorry I didn't spend enough time with you. Pastor, but if I say that, my children will see me as weak. But if you don't say sorry when you should be sorry, then your children will see you as prideful. So which is worse? I'd rather see my children as weak, quote-unquote, but loving rather than prideful and unapproachable. Make sense? So this was meant for the fathers, right? Your sorry, your words of affirmation goes a long way. And look at verse 9. Check it out, okay? Two more verses and we'll close. Verse 9. Look at what Paul says. Remember, he's a spiritual father, right? He says, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. What is Paul saying? Fathers, what is one of the roles that we aim to do in our household? I mean, you set it out to do. You want to provide a home. You want to provide what the family needs. You want to be the anchor of strength. Your wife is the nurturer, but you are the strong man in the house. You are the priest, provider, protector, as God would determine. But notice in verse 9, it's interesting. Paul is saying, sons, daughters, it's okay that we are weak in order to make you strong. So fathers, when you sacrifice your, for your family and you work yourself to the bones and sometimes your health suffers, God sees, your family sees, you are weak to strengthen the home. Nothing wrong with that. And I like how Paul says it that way. In fact, I was pretty amazed when I was looking at this passage and I was saying, I didn't see it this way until I saw this. We are glad, Paul says, when the spiritual fathers are weak, but you, our spiritual sons and daughters, are strong. And look at what he says next. Your restoration is what we pray for. You say, Pastor, right now, I'm happy on Father's Day, but... There's still some unfinished issues in my household. And again, as you know, I'm, I'm not here to judge. I don't know your story. But isn't it good that our Heavenly Father knows your story? Isn't it good? Isn't it good that our Heavenly Father cares enough so that you can hear this sermon about restoration? You say, Pastor, you haven't talked to me about how I can restore. Don't worry, we're coming to that. Okay. All this is set up, is a set up towards that. But first, we need to see how Paul develops this. 
this sermon is developed from Apostle Paul for you. As spiritual fathers, we don't mind being weak so that our sons can be strong. That shows love and commitment and sacrifice and willingness to go the extra mile so that our posterity, our children can succeed. You know, the, uh, my son is here so he can say this, right? Uh, you can check with him after the service, right? You know? So my son actually asked me one of these days, a few weeks ago, he said, Papa, you know, am I better than you in badminton? Because we play badminton quite often. We go downstairs and Papa, Papa, hit badminton. So he said, Papa, if you are 10 upon 10, what am I? I say, 7 upon 10. 7 upon 10. And then he said, Papa, will I be better than you one day? I said, absolutely. I told my son, you'll be better than me in everything. For sure. <laughs> one day you'll be greater than me in everything. Now, I don't know whether that's true. That's my desire for my son, for my daughter. See, when we are weak, we want to make our sons strong. It's, it goes in the same for the church. Church is a, a different, we're not blood, we're not bonded by biological blood, but we're bonded by spiritual blood, the blood of Christ. We are sons and daughters of God, but we are brothers and sisters in faith. And so, if I hear a testimony of some of you guys in trouble, the, the hope I have, like Apostle Paul, and not just myself, your cell leader, the pastors of the churches, that you'll be strengthened by the Lord. The, the grace of God will hold you. That you'll find healing and, and life and health. It's our desire for you. Our desire is not that you go through painful times and never get up. Our desire is the Lord will be with you through the painful times. See, that's always been our hope. As a body of Christ. So this is where you say, Pastor, I, I'm getting to see a sense of restoration. The restoration doesn't come with a 10-point plan. It comes first with seeing the heart of God. How did He restore us to Himself? And we know the story of Jesus coming to pay the price so that we can be reconciled to God. You say, Pastor, why do we have to be reconciled to God? Because the Bible says we were wretched, vile, wicked, despicable, evil sinners. Enemies of God, only deserving of God's fierce wrath and anger. But in His great mercy, the Father sends His Son to be slaughtered on our behalf. He did nothing wrong. We did everything wrong. And yet, what was transferred to us, what was imputed to us, was a righteousness not of our own, a righteousness purchased by the cross. So that's how we know the Father's love. You know, none of us on Judgment Day, in fact, no one on the face of this earth that ever lived, is living or will live on the face of this earth can ever indict God on Judgment Day that the Heavenly Father is not merciful and loving. They cannot do that. It's not possible. They might think they can, but it's not reality. Because God is gracious and merciful and, and loving. And it's His love and kindness that leads us to it. The Bible says repentance. What's repentance? Change of heart, change of mind. Restoration doesn't start with a 10-point program. Restoration starts with a change of heart and a change of mind. You say, Pastor, I want to see the restoration of, our, of my home. Then brother, please hear this without taking offense. Please hear this. Humble yourself. But Pastor, you're saying it's all my fault. I'm not saying that. I'm saying because you're the head of the home, it starts with you. Pastor, I didn't ask for it. It's a moot point. If you're president of a country, prime minister of a nation, you are the director of your company, you are the pastor of the church, you are the husband of the home, you are the head. It starts with you. So your family sees the strength of your words and the power of your actions and the sacrifice and, and the things you do right and they love you for that. But they also need to see your weakness. You say, Pastor, they already know my weakness. No, no, no. Not the kind of sin weakness. The, the weakness as in, I will be weak. 
so that you will be strong. I will allow myself to be weak so that my son, my daughter, my wife can be made strong. And once we approach it that way, humility enters, right? And what happens? Restoration can come. Now, some of you moms will understand this. I'm talking to ladies for a minute. Some of you are right now in a situation where you are trying to balance what your husband situation is and maybe your child situation is. So your child comes to you and said, mom is a dad at home. If he's at home, I can't visit. So your child comes only when your husband is out. And ladies, you're maybe trying to mitigate the, the issue between husband and child. But ladies, apart from prayer, you can't do much. Because honestly, that's why I'm talking to the fathers. Fathers, you have to humble yourself now. and Begin to see that, well, you might not be the one that created the mess or maybe be the greatest fault in the issue. Like Paul the Apostle, do you know that when Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, the first letter he wrote to them, he expressed how disappointed he was with them. So fathers and sons, fathers do that to their sons and daughters at times, right? But by the time we get to this letter, the second letter, he's not writing as a father that's disappointed. He's writing as a father desiring to see, you see the words? The restoration. Look at what he said in verse 9. Your restoration is what we pray for. Paul wants to see families of God restored. Paul wants to see households restored. Paul wants to see the people of God restored. So when fathers humble themselves, like Paul is saying, we're weak so that you can be strong, Something really happens. You don't need your 10 step. You just start with this. Posture, position, shifts. And then all of a sudden, it gets easier, right? You said, Pastor, what do I do next? If I humble myself, what do I do next? Can I suggest something, Fathers? Please don't say sorry for every single thing that transpired because that would not be right because there are things that perhaps your son and daughter have done wrong. But say sorry for what you own what you need to. It could be, I'm sorry that I did not do well enough as your dad in this matter. I'm sorry that I failed you in this. Can you forgive me? Bring the family back home. And you know, enough fathers do this we would see a tremendous shift in the house. So you said, Pastor, why are you talking about fathers this way? Aren't you a father? I know that I'm a father as well. And fathers, sometimes we are pride. We need to see what Paul says. No, no, no. We are glad that we are weak, but our sons are strong. Our daughters are strong. Which means what? It's okay to lose a little. It's okay to humble ourselves a little. And we finish up verse 10. Okay, we finish up. For this reason, I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not tearing down. Now, this verse wouldn't apply to us fathers here. Remember, the context here he's speaking is to the spiritual church of Corinth. He's expressing to them the whole garment I want you restored. I want you strong. I want you to know God. I want the truth to set in. I want all these things. I want you to have the restoration that we're praying for. But at the same time, Paul cautions in verse 10 to tell them, please, as sons and daughters in the church of Corinth, please heed these words because when I come and visit you, I don't want to come and start scolding. I don't want to come with the desire to say words that will hurt you. Paul is saying, I want to do this all for the building up of God's people. Now, let, let, let's close up very beautifully, okay? You said, Pastor, 
I'm a father. When I scold my family, it's out of love. Yes, I cannot deny. But the problem with the, 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 the two prong of scolding is this, right? When the words fly out from your mouth, fathers, and you might be speaking in truth, but there's also unintended consequence that might come if your words become overly cutting. There's one kind of cutting that is good, that motivates, that disciplines, that encourages someone to move ahead. But there are also words that pull down. You say, Pastor, give me an example. Okay, one example is if your son and daughter is not doing so well in school, they did something wrong, okay? Clearly wrong. And you're in a place of disciplining them. And you're angry, rightly so, because they did something wrong. If you address them in what they did wrong and show your displeasure, that's not the problem. The problem is when you go further. So for instance, if your son failed the exam and you say things like, why are you so stupid? How come you cannot be as smart as your cousin? Why can you not be like me who is a scholar? Friend, Anger, I know. You said, but pastor, I didn't mean it. No, I just said it. Humble yourself. Find a way by God's grace not to say words like that. You could say, I'm disappointed. You failed. I'm upset. There's going to be a bit of punishment and discipline in this. And then maybe when you cool down, you encourage, all right? I know you can do better. I know you can. Let's pray. Let's believe God. Do better. He said, Pastor, this is so difficult. For we are glad when we are weak. Our sons and daughters are strong. He said, Pastor, what you're saying now is too late. I wish I met you 20 years ago, Pastor. You met me 20 years ago, so no point. I'm not a father then. I don't know what to tell you. No. <laughs> right? But honestly, even if you met me 20 years ago and I was a father then, you don't have to look at the past now, you just have to look at your present and how we advance our future. See, everything I'm sharing now has nothing to do with, oh no, pastor, I'm already past that stage, now my children have their own children, what am I going to do? You still can do something now. You can't, you can't go back to teenage years of your kids, but you can now, wherever you are, desire, decide to see the restoration of the homes. Now I'm done. There's one thing I want to do now, which is to pray for the restoration of our homes. Now, friends, some of you have wonderful homes, okay? Would you, as we pray, pray for our other lighters that might not have that? And again, can I say this, really? It's so important. For those of us that need our homes restored, you are not inferior to those that have good homes. It's so important. It's the danger in the church is looking down on one another. We, we don't do that. If one of our brother and sister is hurting, we, we pray with them. We don't gossip. We don't slander. We pray with them. We want to see the household of God strong. If you have strong homes, as we pray, pray for our brothers and sisters. And, and I tell you honestly, guys, if every one of us right now opened up what's happening in the home, you would we can't leave this service. If everything that needs restoration is displayed on the screen behind me, we'll stay here till tomorrow at least. So I know that in the house of God, there are people hurting. And some of you are hurting real bad. And fathers, I want to say one word to you now before we pray. Everything I said to you is not to condemn you. Some of you say, Pastor, I can't humble myself until I'm, I'm healed as well. Maybe some of you fathers, you have past hurts that have made you the man you are today and you, are, you find it difficult. Okay, so let's pray for your restoration, okay? Fathers, we pray for your restoration as the Lord helps you to restore your home. And for those of us that need this prayer, in fact, can we have the whole church to stand for a moment? Tampanese Woodlands, would you stand? Would you close your eyes with me, friends? This is an important and serious prayer. I hope you know it. We sense it in the room. The atmosphere of the room is shifting. You know why? Because from the depths of our hearts, we want to see our families made strong. We all want that. 
We all want that. In the heat of battle at work, in the heat of battle, in the world we live in, when we come back to the home, it has to be that place of rest and peace and joy and comfort and safety. Would you close your eyes with me right now? Can I ask all of us to lift up our hands, please? We're praying for our households. Right now, the first part of the prayer is praying for our fathers, okay? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We pray for all the dads in our church and also our dads that might not be Christian that are outside of the church of God. But Lord, we pray somehow after hearing this sermon through Apostle Paul, Lord, we pray that our fathers will humble themselves, Lord, but heal them, heal them. Some of the wounds our dads and our papas carry, we don't understand. We don't understand. But Lord, heal them, Lord. Help us as sons and daughters to also bear the wounds of our parents, knowing that our parents have gone through so much. Help us to step in the gap and pray for them. Lord, we pray for our dads to be made strong. We pray for our dads to be healed in Jesus' name that the things that were done to them, against them, the, 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 the things they went through doesn't have to be a stigma in their life anymore. It was, but it shall not be anymore. By the stripes of Jesus Christ, every single dad we're praying for is healed. Amen. Amen. I want to believe that, don't you? Amen. We pray for our fathers. Amen. Second part of the prayer, all the fathers that are here, stay where you are. I don't ask you to come up to the altar. This is all for us fathers right now. We pray, we humble ourselves. Is that okay? Lord, I'm starting to pray for myself and all the fathers here. As you heal us, Lord, humble us as well. Lord, there are mistakes that we have made and there are faults that we have done and there's words that shouldn't have been said and there's some actions that needs to be repented of. But oh God, while we had good intent as fathers, well, some of the things we did fell short. But... Having said that, Lord, forgive us, but also humble us. Humble us, Lord, to go to our wives and say sorry when we should. Humble us to say sorry to our children when we should. Lord, it's painful, it's hard, but help us, oh God. It's going to bring healing to our spouse and our children in a way, in a way that can never be understated. No gifts can replace that. No, my concessions can replace that. Humble us, oh God. Humble us by your mighty hand. Lord, we give you thanks. I know that every single father in Lighthouse Evangelism, we want to say like the Apostle Paul, we are willing to be weak so that our sons and daughters will be strong. We are willing. Lord, keep us humble, Lord. Keep us healthy, Lord. Strengthen us. In every way, we want to see our children more than succeed us. We want to see them success in every way, in their spirit, in their soul, in their body, in every way. Lord, we speak this now over all of us. Fathers, I say this to you. God has placed you as the head of the home. It's, it's an awesome responsibility. It's a difficult responsibility, but He placed you for such a time as this. And as a church, we want to honour all our fathers, the sacrifices you have made, the love you have given, the things you have done so that your family can know the Lord and your family can be made strong. Can we give a hand to all fathers here? Amen. Amen. Just one thing before we sing and kind of close. See, the last verse, Paul says, all of it is for the building up. You know, on Father's Day, we, you can't focus only on the Father. You can because we celebrate the fathers. But you know, it's like on Mother's Day, we celebrate the mothers, but it's the whole family in celebration. Makes sense? Father's Day, we celebrate the father specifically, but the whole family celebrates. You see, the building up of God's people and our families is the same. I, I want you to hear me now on this, okay? Because if one of us is in trouble, the Bible says if, if your pinky is in pain, the whole body hurts, right? And, and, and sometimes when I come on the pulpit, I, I'm on the verge of crying, not because I want to cry, but because I begin to sense in the Spirit the hurts of the people. 
I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to start crying, but there's hurts in the body of Christ. And some of this, I can't help you. I only can say, God, help us. Lord, heal us. Restore our homes. God, put, help us to put aside whatever that is causing all the bad ill will and things that should not be there. But this is what I want to do so that we don't focus on fathers now, okay? We, we focus the whole service on fathers. Now let's focus on families just as we close. We want to see our families united. Really, we do. I want to see my family strong. I want to see your family strong. If your family is in trouble and my family is well, we're all hurting. We all affect one another. We are all in the body of Christ. We all hurt together. So can we all pray for families just for a moment, okay? Would you lift up your hands with me? And let's pray for every household in our church. Guys, we're not doing this religiously. We're doing this because we need the help of God. Heavenly Father, hear our cry. Every single week, there's at least several people in the church that are going through hardship that we don't really know, but it's them. Pain and strife. Family challenges that is beyond human understanding at times. God, we pray for your healing hand. Please, oh God. As I pray as a representation of the church, more importantly, my brothers and sisters are praying alongside with me. That's so important. And they're praying alongside with me because that's what we want collectively. While I speak for the church, the church speaks together because we are praying for the restoration of our homes. Lord, restore our homes. Oh God, restore our homes. Let the tears of the saints, let the love in our hearts, let the truth of your word, let the power of the Spirit rise up, oh God. Hear our cries. God, hear our cries. And we pray this collectively and with unison, knowing it's not Pastor Pace's prayer, but our prayers, our prayers, rising to your throne room. Oh God, heal our homes. In Jesus' name, amen.